um, uh, welcome everyone. As I just uh, to orient everyone again, um, uh, we'll start with an um, uh, an ESI presentation from uh, Ashley George, uh, um, uh, followed by our invited guest uh, uh, Katie Barr's uh, talk. Um, and then after that, uh, will be uh, um, uh, the following hour will be a science spotlight uh, focused on the VA that uh, Steve Uckel has led. So, without further ado, let me um, uh, introduce Ashley uh, George to you all. So she um, obtained her BS from Humboldt State University, where she majored in biology with an emphasis on cellular and molecular biology. Um, and uh, she uh, followed that with an internship uh, sponsored by CIRM, the California Institute for uh, Institute for Regenerative Medicine, Dr. Uh, Linda Giedice's uh, uh, lab, uh, focusing on mesenchymal stem cell differentiation and endometriosis, and got her PhD at Rutgers, um, uh, where she um, uh, focused on maternal programming of uterine development. Uh, in adult endometrial function uh, in animal models. Um, and then in 2018, she joined uh, Nadia Rohn's lab uh, at Gladstone, where she's been using mass cytometry to better understand HIV infection and pathogenesis, with a particular focus on women uh, living with HIV. And I should also note that she, you know, her work uh, received a Young Investigator Prize at the, the AIDS 2020 conference. And so we're uh, really delighted uh, to have her um, uh, here for the ESI talk today. And uh, take it away, Ashley. Great, thank you for that introduction. Let me share my screen. Can everyone see that all right? Okay, great. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you to the CIFAR leadership um, for the opportunity to share some of our research today. So while HIV infection can be controlled with optimum ART, HIV persists within long-lived tissue reservoirs, which can be divided into anatomical reservoirs, cellular, and molecular reservoirs. In a seminal study by Jake Estes and colleagues, the vast majority of the anatomic HIV reservoir was found to persist within secondary lymphoid tissues, including the gut, lymph nodes, spleen, and lung. Shown here is a graphical representation of these findings with the proportion of SIV RNA positive cells in each organ system before and after suppressive ART illustrated by colored dots. As you can see, the primary reservoir sites of infections are lymphoid tissues with blue dots for gut, red dots for lymph nodes, and green dots for spleen and yellow dots for lung tissues where approximately 99.6% of the RNA positive cells reside. Within lymphoid tissues, there are different anatomical compartments, including the extra uh, follicular T cell zone, as well as the B cell follicle. Shown here is an in situ hybridization image of lymph nodes from SIV infected monkey with SIV RNA shown in red. As you can see, SIV is mainly found in the B cell follicles where target CD4 T follicular helper cells reside. Migration of cells into the B cell follicle is driven by the chemokine receptor CXCR5. However, most effector cells that can target HIV infector, uh, infected cells, including CD8 T cells, do not express CXCR5. Therefore, HIV persists within the B cell follicle despite effective ART. As shown in these micrographs of lymph nodes from SIV infected monkeys, a vast number of red CD8 T cells surround the white B cell follicle, but relatively few CD8 T cells are shown within the follicle itself. This leads us to ask the question, what are the characteristics of these rare follicular CXCR5 positive CD8 T cells within lymph nodes of people living with HIV? To answer this question, we obtained freshly isolated paired blood and lymph node specimens from aviremic people living with HIV. We then deeply phenotyped these specimens to address the following questions. How do CD8 T cells differ between blood and lymph node? And what are the features of CXCR5 positive T cells that have the potential to migrate into the follicles? For this study, we utilize mass cytometry, or CITOF, which is similar to flow cytometry, but instead of using antibodies labeled with fluorescent tags, uh, 
elemental isotopes were used, allowing you to examine many more parameters simultaneously. Our CITOF panel um, included 42 different markers, including those related to um, cell lineage, inhibitory receptors, activating receptors, markers of differentiation state and activation state, as well as tissue homing receptors. As CXCR5 can direct CD8 T cells to the follicles, we first determined to what extent CXCR5 was expressed on CD8 T cells from blood and lymph nodes. We found that CXCR5 positive cells are more prevalent in lymph nodes as compared to blood. We first then compared expression levels of tissue homing receptors between lymph node CXCR5 positive cells and CXCR5 negative CD8 T cells to gain a better understanding as to whether these cells can traffic to other lymphoid tissues. As shown here, expression of the gut tissue homing receptor CCR6 and the lymph node homing receptors CCR7 and CD62L were significantly increased on the CXCR5 positive cells, suggesting the ability of these cells to migrate into multiple lymphoid tissues. There are also markers that identify long-lived cells, including TCF1, a transcription factor important for expansion and self renewal, and CD127, which promotes T cell survival and proliferation. When we looked at expression levels of these markers on the CXCR5 positive CD8 T cells in the lymph node, we found that they were elevated compared to the CXCR5 negative cells, suggesting these cells are also long-lived. Finally, we looked whether to see if we can find any phenotypic features telling us how functional these cells would be. Interestingly, we found inhibitory uh, receptors CUR2DL1, CD94, and NKG2A were significantly increased on the CXCR5 positive cells. These inhibitory receptors have previously been reported to be expressed on T cells and to inhibit their function, suggesting that lymph node CXCR5 CD8 T cells may be restrained in their vector function. This is also supported by the fact that the activating receptor was decreased on the CXCR5 positive cells. In summary, our data support the following model of properties of CXCR5 positive CD8 T cells. First, we find CXCR5 expressing CD8 T cells have brought, um, are more abundant in the lymph nodes than in blood. Additionally, we find that lymph node CXCR5 positive CD8 T cells have broad tissue homing capabilities and are long lived. However, we also found that these cells express a number of inhibitory receptors, which can dampen CD8 T cell effector function. These data suggest that within the B cell follicle, CD8 T cells may be preferentially restricted to their effector functions. Consistent with this notion, our recent reports that lymph node HIV-specific CXCR5 positive CD8 T cells from both controller and non-controller people living with HIV exhibit poor cytolytic activity ex vivo. Therefore, strategies aimed to eradicate the lymphoid tissue HIV reservoir may need to not only increase CD8 T cell entry into the B cell follicle, but also release their intrinsic breaks on their cytolytic or other effector mechanisms, perhaps through antagonism of the inhibitory receptors. Uh, so with that, um, I just have a few acknowledgements. Um, a huge thank you to the Rome Lab, who is very helpful and super collaborative. Um, and a big thank you to the SCOPE team, who um, helped us with acquisition of these samples. Um, and a, um, a big thank you to all the participants um, who were willing to participate in this study. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. That was terrific. Um, and uh, we can uh, open it up to questions. Um, uh, please go ahead and raise your hand if you want to ask a question. I can start out. Um, um, uh, it's, it's really interesting that um, both uh, CD8s uh, and, uh, and K cells uh, tend to be by and large excluded from the B cell follicle. And um, 
Um, and it's uh, so along with that theme, you know, your identification of inhibitory receptors on CD8 that are also expressed on NK cells suggest some sort of common mechanisms um, suppressing um, both those cell types um, uh, in, in the B cell follicle. And I wondered if you might elaborate on that and, and may, maybe speculate as to as to why those mechanisms exist in the first place. Why would um, uh, you want to suppress some um, uh, cytolytic uh, uh, functions, for example, inside the B cell follicle? Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so we actually also did look at NK cells. Um, unfortunately, there were too few CXC or 5 positive cells to really um, deeply um, characterize them, but we did look at the within the lymph node as well. And they also seem to have some inhibitory function um, per their receptors. Um, as to why they might be dampened in their function, um, I would suspect it's um, due to um, a, a protective mechanism. So you also within the B cell follicle, you have all these, um, in addition to HIV infected cells, you have other CD4, uh, other cells um, producing antibody responses and other adaptive responses. So having that immune privileged site, it's probably um, uh, likely to protect it is, is our best guess. Great. And, and, and then to you know, follow up, uh, the, uh, uh, Michaela uh, miller trutman has some data in these um, viremic uh, non-progressor uh, you know, uh, monkeys, the non-pathogenic models, um, uh, where um, NK cells are actually able to infiltrate the uh, the B cell follicles and suppress um, replication, and and I don't think you know I think they you know they 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 do okay. Um, uh, so there may be an animal model that suggests a safe way to do this. Um, yes, of course, and and that's the goal. <laughs> okay, great. Other um, other questions? Okay. Um, you know, hearing none, Ashley, I turn the floor over to you so you can introduce our guest speaker. Okay, great. Congratulations again on a great talk. Thank you very much. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's CIFAR seminar speaker, Dr. Catherine Barr, who is coming to us virtually from the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Barr earned her BA from Northwestern University and her MD from the University of Iowa. After that, she completed her residency in internal medicine at Virginia Commonwealth University and an infectious disease, diseases fellowship at the University of Alabama, where she worked with Beatrice Hahn. Dr. Barr then joined the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania, where she is an assistant professor of medicine and director of the Penn CIFAR virus and reservoirs core. Dr. Barr is a physician scientist who has dedicated her career to pursuing prevention, treatment, and cure strategies for HIV and AIDS. Much of her recent work focuses on translation of basic science discovery through preclinical testing in non-human primate models and human clinical trials of HIV cure and prevention strategies, including BNAMs. Her lab is also working on characterizing the viral dynamics and host immune responses during analytical treatment interruption. And along with Beatrice Hahn has generated some fascinating new data that help characterize the immunologic selection pressures that affect viral rebound. I suspect she'll be sharing much of that work with us today. She's a rare translational investigator who is able to lead both basic virology studies and clinical trials and communicate science effectively to a broad audience. She's also a wonderful role model for other women in science like me. I'm honored to introduce her today. Today, Dr. Barr will be speaking on uh, lessons learned from viral rebound after antiretroviral treatment interruption. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Barr. Thank you, Ashley. That was really sweet. Appreciate <laughs> that. Um, can you all hear me okay? Can I get a thumbs up if I, you can actually hear? Okay, Sounds perfect. Good. All right, so um, I'm gonna try to not speak so fast that it's, you know, dizzying, but also try to fit in some, a couple stories within 35 minutes that hopefully mesh together at the end. So these are lesson learned from treatment interruption about the viral and immune dynamics of rebound. And this is really, as a translational researcher, 
is really interested in the intersection of clinical trials and sort of bench research. This has been the, my area of focus for the past five or 10 years almost is understanding rebound. And so I'm sure you all understand deeply what I mean by this, but when we have an individual who's suppressed on antiretrovirals and their virus plummets down below the limit of detection, um, and they're in this sort of chronic steady state where there's a latent reservoir that persists, very low level plasma viremia that sort of percolates under the level of detection. This is sort of our, our you know, our healthy um, person living with HIV that we are trying to figure out how we can suppress that virus and or eradicate that virus without antiretrovirals. But we know if we interrupt that therapy, um, virus invariably rebounds. And it is this context and this virus, this rebound virus that I've been interested in studying. And I, there's two main reasons why I think this is important. First of all, the latent reservoir is incredibly challenging to study. These are rare events spread throughout the body with many, many hiding places and nuances in terms of how replication competent or genetically intact they are. So studying the reservoir is incredibly challenging, but treatment interruption allows us to see replicating viruses that were just recently reservoir viruses. So this is a direct uh, you know, connection to the reservoir. The second reason I think rebound is important is this is the clinical juncture at which suppressive therapies will be tested and curative strategies will be um, evaluated to see if they've um, done their job. And so understanding what happens at baseline is important for judging these strategies and then working to improve them. So viral rebound has been a well-known concept since shortly after the advent of antiretrovirals. So this is a study published in 1999 from the NIH where they took individuals who'd been suppressed on antiretrovirals for a couple of years, they stopped their therapy. And you can see from all these colorful lines going quickly up, individuals virus rebounded very quickly. Um, within just a few short weeks, all of these individuals had experienced viral rebound. And viral rebound pretty much looks the same nowadays. We have multiple studies sort of accruing these data and um, work by Jonathan Lee and others have shown us that Overall, we see that more than 85% of individuals have viral rebound within four weeks of treatment interruption, and the vast majority by eight weeks. There are a few individuals termed post-treatment controllers who are quite unique, and we're not gonna talk about those today, but those are a very important uh, group of people to understand and hopefully try to reproduce in some ways. Um, we also know from early studies of viral rebound that when viruses rebound, it's not a single virus that happens to sneak through. It's multiple genetically distinct viruses, each of which came from a different latently infected cell that Ashley was talking about in these different tissue reservoirs. So there's multiple viruses that rapidly break through to cause virus reactivation and systemic replication upon treatment interruption. We also know that various cure strategies, be they suppressive or eradicative, can reduce that or, 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 or lengthen that time to rebound and or reduce the number of lineages that rebound. And so we can modulate rebound with our interventions. But many questions remain. And the things I'm focusing on are the origin and biology of these rebound viruses and the host immune pressures that limit this emergence and how we can better understand these concepts. So the first study that we did that allowed me to sort of investigate rebound in depth was A5340. So this is an ACTG study looking at the effect of VRCO1, one of our early but very exciting initially broad and potent um, CD4 binding site VNAPs. And so the question that we had almost 10 years ago now when this study was conceived back in the halcyon days when early VNAPs were thought to both be a great model for vaccine development, but maybe also all by themselves could sort of magically suppress virus in a healthy and well-tolerated way. So we were very optimistic and we set out to see if we take a small number of individuals, we give them three doses of this antibody and we stop their antiretrovirals, can we have that antibody maintain suppression durably and it would be fabulous. Well, what we saw was that same picture that we saw back in 1999, that very quickly within two to five weeks, almost all of these individuals virus came right back. Sorry, I'm gonna try to move my little warnings away. All of these viruses came right back um, or in the vast majority of these individuals. And it didn't look that different than what we saw in treatment interruption from people who had no intervention at all. And so the majority of participants experienced rebound with two to five weeks. Oops, sorry, I gotta, <laughs> okay. Um, 
but we did see actually a modest delay um, versus historical controls, with, which bought us that little bit of uh, clinical and statistical significance that allowed us to publish this study. Um, and that's because there were a few participants who did not have pre-existing resistance to this antibody, and therefore there was effective suppression. Um, in addition, this treatment interruption was clinically really well tolerated. In fact, if you talk to the participants of the study, they did not know, they were not aware when their virus returned. They did not have clinical symptoms. Um, and for the several weeks of viremia, uh, we started um, ART right back after two uh, confirmed viral loads greater than 200. But for the median of five weeks that these individuals viremic, they didn't have symptoms, they didn't feel uncomfortable. There was, it was relatively um, well tolerated. But we wanted to ask, did we alter the reservoir? Did, we, did this ATI do anything you know, untoward? And what is the relationship between the reservoir and these viruses that so easily rebounded? So that sort of started the next part of this study, which I think digs into some of the more interesting um, biological questions. So the second part of this question was, does ATI alter the reservoir? And we used quantitative and qualitative comparisons first of the two reservoir time points we had sampled. So we sampled at the start of the trial, and then we, start, we sampled six to 12 months after antiretrovirals had resuppressed viremia. And so we wanted to compare those reservoirs, and then we wanted to compare those plasma virus populations that were replicating systemically during treatment interruption with those reservoir viruses. Um, and so we used quantificated or quant a reservoir quantification. We used phylogenetic or sequence analysis, and then we looked at the phenotype of these viruses in order to compare. So at the first at first blush, at the time we had pretty standard reservoir assays looking at total DNA and cell associated RNA in our reservoir cells, and those as well as replication competent virus by um, virus outgrowth assay or stimulating cells and seeing which viruses could reactivate. All of those assays showed no change in the size of the reservoir from the several years in which that trial happened, a short ATI with five weeks of iremia happened. So we saw no major changes in the size of the reservoir. So next we want on to look at the quality of the reservoir through sequence analysis. And this is, this is the like Halloween, October season jump scare where a phylogenetic tree just shows up without anyone being aware of it. But I'll try to walk you through it so it's not quite as horrific. But um, so in this phylogenetic tree, we're looking at envelope sequences. So this is 2,500 nucleotides, and they're all arranged in this tree. The genetic distance is shown by a horizontal difference. And what we're looking at here are sequences from pre-art. So this individual actually had a banked plasma sample from before they started antiretrovirals. And then we're looking in red and orange triangles at the first and second weeks of detectable plasma viremia during rebound. And then we're looking at the sequences from the virus outgrowth assay. So each one of those individual um, cultures that grew a replication competent virus, we sequenced that envelope and threw it onto the tree. And so we're able to look at the reservoir before and after the treatment interruption in these squares that are filled or, or empty compared to the rebound virus. And this participant, what you can see, or what I can tell you, you should be able to see, is that there's actually quite a bit of di virus diversity in this person's populations. So this is a fairly, the little scale down at the bottom is 20 nucleotides. So there's quite a bit of diversity within this person's virus. Um, and if we look at those reservoir viruses, what you may notice is some of these align very close to each other. Some of these from before and two years later after this whole trial. So we have sequences from distinct cells uh, that are identical in envelope, suggesting that they may be expanded clones within the reservoir that are identical to each other. And so you can see there's a bunch of different blue squares throughout this tree. There's a diverse reservoir that's represented. But if we look at the rebound viruses, those that reactivated at treatment interruption, they're not closely related. They don't overlap or co-align with any of those reservoir viruses. So if we look at another phylogenetic tree from a different individual, this person has a much more narrow reservoir, and yet we see the same trends. We see reservoir viruses from before and after that are in fact identical to each other. So we see clonal sequences here um, that are um, the same in envelope. And we also see that our single rebound lineage is, 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 it falls within the general phylogeny of this participant, but it is quite distinct. It is not overlapping with any of the reservoirs samples. So the fact that we see oops, no overlap between our sampled pre and post ATI reservoir, 
um, and the rebound sequences suggest either there's a disconnect between these virus populations or we've really undersampled the reservoir. And I think there's a strong argument to be made that with these few sequences, we've really undersampled. Um, so to try to address that, oh, sorry, I messed, moved all this stuff. Okay. So to try to address this, I have one more participant I want to show you that I think sort of defies that rule. So this is AO1. And the important, interesting thing about this individual's reservoir is that if you look at all these blue squares, they all align exactly on top of each other, meaning that they are, for the most part, identical in envelope. And this most likely represents a huge expanded clone. And we've actually gone through and done all of the full genome sequencing. And so we can confirm this is a huge clone that has taken over the majority of the replication competent reservoir in this individual. And yet, even when we have a really homogeneous reservoir, when we allow treatment interruption to happen, four distinct viruses rebound and none of them are that clone. So there seems to be, through these participants, a real disconnect between the reservoir and the rebound viruses. Um, so just to dig in a little deeper, there's other ways of sampling the reservoir. So, and these are all circulating um, blood cells that we're looking at, but we can do much more in-depth sequencing than we can virus reactivation through outgrowth assay. So here, what I've done with all of these purple triangles is we've gone to the cells and we've sequenced intact envelopes. So these are only cells that have integrated proviral DNA that has a fully intact envelope gene. And if you add all of those sequences on here, you can see it flushes out the tree. It makes it really sort of disorganized and hard to figure out. But I will just point out to you, here's the same large expanded um, uh, replication competent clone that we were just looking at. And what we can see in our purple sequences, in fact, there's many expanded clones, many identical sequences that are aligning together. Um, but it's quite a different distribution than if we look at the replication competent reservoir. So our little donut plots, which show the representation of these different, these different clones, with our virus outgrowth assay, we see it's largely comprised of this one red virus. Um, and then in our uh, intact envelopes, we see many different clones that appear intact, as well as a bunch of singletons. So just one more level of sequencing. If we take those same proviruses and we only include viruses with intact whole genomes, so we're actually sequencing fully in intact viruses with open reading frames throughout the genome, and we only include those, we can get another representation of the, of the reservoir. And it looks closer to what we see in the replication competent virus and that we have two large expanded clones, but it is a little bit different. So my point is that you can sample the reservoir through many different methods and they have validity, each one of them with a different level of effort and a different level of restriction. But, uh, and so the, the method that you use to sample the reservoir is really important. But regardless of the method, when you're sampling the blood reservoir, we do not see overlap between the viruses that rebound and the viruses that are sampled in the reservoir. They're similar, but not identical. And other groups have done similar studies looking at other recently conducted ATI trials and found very similar results. Similar results. So if we recognize there's this distinct reservoir and rebar virus population, what are the implications? So I think the first implication is that if you can't predict what's going to rebound, your pre-screening efforts may be challenging. You may not be able to do a pre-screening test for sensitivity to X, Y, or Z agent and know if that's the virus that you're trying to prevent from reactivating. It's not completely useful, but you have to recognize there are caveats. Second of all, because we did not see those rebound viruses flesh out that post-ATI reservoir, it's likely that there's not a lot of reseeding of that reservoir with that rebound viremia, which is always a concern. We don't want to do harm in our trials. Um, it also suggests some mechanisms. So what are the possible mechanisms for this disconnect? It may be that we're just really undersampling an under, uh, like a minor or an unsampled reservoir. So maybe these are very, very rare cells within the blood. Maybe they are tissue located. So actually discuss the importance of the tissue reservoir, but maybe these cells don't commingle with the, um, the circulation as much as we think they do. Maybe they're not, uh, maybe they're compartmentalized into the central nervous system or the genital tract. Maybe they're not CD4 positive T cells. Maybe the key reactivating viruses are macrophage lineage or other cells. So maybe our sampling methods are just the problem and the, those reservoirs, those rebound cells are there. We're just not targeting them correctly. There's another possibility, and that is that immune pressures at the time of treatment interruption 
may select for specific viruses and or drive rapid adaptation of unique viruses. And so I don't think this is an either or situation, but I'm gonna talk next about our interferon story, which sort of lends credence to the second mechanism that perhaps immune pressures are highly selective at treatment interruption. So type 1 interferons are potent anti antiviral innate effectors. They're hugely important in our defense against many viruses. As we're all sitting in the COVID pandemic, we recognize the relevance. In HIV, they are specifically shown to constrain transmission. And we also know they modulate disease course in different ways throughout other components of infection, but they're particularly important in transmission. And so early work looking at interferon resistance by my colleague, um, Beatrice Hahn, showed that these transmitted founder viruses, the viruses that establish infection, one of the most salient phenotypic characteristics, one of the things that really differentiates them from the rest of viruses circulating during chronic infection is their resistance to type one interferons. So in this experiment, they're looking at chronic donors and acute recipients. So these are donor recipient pairs in which the acutely infected individual was, test was sampled very closely after transmission. And the person who was phenotypically co connected or phylogenetically connected as a, as a donor was also sampled at that time. And if you look at viruses from the chronic donor as well as from the acute recipient, you can take virus isolates or infectious molecular clones, and you can replicate, you can grow them in CD4 positive T cells with various concentrations of interferon and get an IC50 or a concentration of interferon that limits replication. And with that, you can judge the sensitivity of these viruses to inhibition by interferon. And so what we're showing here is interferon to, inter, uh, I'm sorry, IC50s to interferon beta, which is a type one interferon. And what you can see in these classic, uh, these um, chronic viruses is there's a range of sort of modest sensitivity to interferons and all of their donor recipient pairs have highly resistant um, viruses. And so recently we looked at that uh, phenomenon or that phenotype at uh, acute infection and asked, how does that change over time? And so we looked at a historical cohort from the US and from England of individuals identified during acute infection, followed over several years of natural history, and then started on antiretrovirals as these gray bars. So viral load is shown in red and CD4 T cell count in blue. Um, and if we look at these top six individuals whose clinical histories are shown on the left, we can track the sensitivity of to interferon of their viruses over time. And what you see in general is then these six individuals on top were sort of normal progressors. You see that there's a high level of interferon resistance at transmission in every one of these individuals over the first six to 12 months of infection that falls. Theoretically, as interferons and other inflammatory markers sort of settle down into that chronic latent period, and then slowly as disease, uh, disease progression continues, we see a slight rise in interferon resistant around the time when they meet criteria, these are historical criteria, but criteria for CD4 decline or some other symptom that precipitated antiretroviral initiation. And so you can see what we call this SMILE phenotype, this kind of starting up high, going down low, and then slowly creeping up across the board very consistently in these six individuals. Next, you can see um, we have two individuals who were very slow progressors. So they had, they had maintained their CD4 T cell counts, their viral loads were quite low. And what you can see here is we started with interferon resistance, it fell early and it stayed low as they did not um, mount any sort of clinical progression. And finally, we have two individuals who are rapid progressors. And unfortunately, these individuals experienced really dramatic clinical courses with high level viremia, rapid CD4 T cell depletion, and a lot of clinical um, morbidity. So you can see the interferon levels of their viruses start high and stay high, um, uh, really reflecting the lack of a sort of clinically latent period. So if we look at this consistent, or I'm sorry, if we look at these kinetics over time, you can see that many of these individuals started on antiretrovirals at some point in time. So our next question is, if we look at these reservoir viruses, how do they compare with this natural history of virus, viremia, that theoretically is all the viruses that could have seeded that reservoir that is now sitting there on suppressive art waiting for us to sample it? So on the left here is a phylogenetic tree, which color codes from blue to pink from early infection through later infection. And you can see it sort of starts as a narrow virus population and then gets more and more diversification over time. 
And then this for this individual, we see our nice interferon smile for alpha or interferon alpha two, as well as interferon beta. And then we have our years of antiretroviral treatment and about a year or two after antiretroviral suppression, we have a sample of virus outgrowth assay that we can assess for interferon resistance. And fascinatingly, it sort of aligns um, at this time point phenotypically um, near the time of antiretroviral initiation. And if we look at our sequences, this is the sequence of the virus from that time point. You can see it also aligns with the viruses that are replicating near the time of antiretroviral initiation. And so this aligns with a lot of recent research by the Caprisa cohort and others showing that much of this durable reservoir is formed right at that time period before our initiation. And so we can look across multiple participants and see regardless of how long through um, art suppression we sample, that we find these reservoir viruses are in fact similar phenotypically and sequence to the viruses that circulated at the time of our initiation. So I think that's an, an, an interesting phenomenon. But importantly, they're not that resistant to interference. They're, rel they're sort of this mid-level relatively sensitive virus. And that's important when we start to think about rebound. So the next we asked for some individuals who underwent treatment interruption, can we look at rebound and reservoir viruses? So let's go back to AO9, this diverse reservoir from um, this individual who participated in A5340. And if we look at these rebound viruses, what do they look like phenotypically? So fortunately we have reservoir viruses and we have re rebound viruses from this individual. And what we can see is that these rebound viruses, and here we're looking at the IC50 to beta inter or interferon beta, these rebound viruses are kind of incredibly resistant to type 1 interferons. They are more resistant than anything we've seen to date, um, and this was a really striking finding. And it turns out when we look across all of these different clinical trials in which we had treatment interruption, these pink circles representing rebound viruses are all at the top of our chart. So for alpha 2A as well as interferon beta, we're seeing really high level interferon resistance uniquely high resistance in these rebound viruses um, in a way that we haven't really seen in any other acute um, reservoir chronic virus. So if we put these all together, um, what we can see is I'm going to march you through all of the viruses that we had up to about a year ago. So here is a group of chronic donors and acute recipients. So this is that donor recipient pair we showed before. And you can see there's a range of um, sensitivities in the chronic donors and our acute viruses are all a bit higher. And then we can add this longitudinal cohort where we describe the kinetics over time. And we can see that we have acute viruses, early um, sort of nadir viruses in the first six to 12 months, and then slowly increasing over time. We have a few reservoir viruses from these individuals. And then we can add our ATI participants. And what you can see here, again, our reservoir viruses are kind of mid-level sensitive and all of our, um, our rebound viruses are quite, quite resistant. Um, and so I think that th this is just a really remarkable finding of a consistent phenotype, which I've never actually been a part of before. <laughs> but I think it has a bunch of interesting implications. And I'll just say in this model here of sort of how these things relate to each other, we see that our um, rebound viruses are in fact statistically a little bit more resistant even than our transmitted founder viruses, which for me is really surprising because Many people in primary HIV are symptomatic. They have a model-like syndrome. Some people are quite symptomatic. Some people are asymptomatic. But in my personal clinical experience with ATI trial participants, none of them felt bad. None of them had symptoms of cytokine storm. None of them had tissue inflammation that they were subjectively um, particularly aware of. So I think this was a really surprising finding for me, sort of wetting the clinical and the translational research. But I think this suggests the only way you get viruses that have a really distinct phenotype is because they are reacting to whatever environmental pressures they have. And so this suggests strong selection pressure in the tissues from, which the, from where these viruses are reactivating that are forcing somehow these viruses to either select or adapt to get to this more resistant state. So as a brief summary of what we've discussed so far, I think the disconnect between these sampled reservoir and these rebound viruses is, is one of the important findings of the work that I've been able to participate with uh, in the last few years. It's, confirm it's confirmed both by multiple groups sequencing analysis, as well as these this interferon phenotype, which really reinforces the sequence analysis, which in my opinion, although 
I am a big proponent of it, does have weaknesses, particularly in the realm of undersampling. Um, but it's also been confirmed across multiple ATI studies, across different labs doing this work. And so I think it's, an, uh, it's, it's really interesting. So what are the potential mechanisms for this? So as we said before, perhaps these rebound competent, highly interferon resistant viruses are just really rare or comp compartmentalized. And we as a field need to figure out how to enhance our sampling techniques, how to pull these rare things from the blood virus, from circulating um, you know, reservoir, or to look in these important lymphoid or other compartmentalized tissues like the central nervous system. Now, tissue sampling is really challenging in humans. And I think this is also why it's incredibly important for us to develop predictive animal models. And that's one of my area, other areas of focus is trying to get a good animal model for persistence and rebound so that we can sort of dig into these tissues and this eclipse period from which these things arise. So the second potential mechanism, and these are not mutually exclusive, is that there's intense innate and potentially other selective pressures at the time of treatment interruption that forces reservoir viruses to differentiate themselves into a new type of virus that is both genetically and phenotypically distinct from what is sampled in our classic blood reservoirs. The universal to date interferon resistance of rebounds suggests that innate immunity, in particular type one interferons, are a really potent force during these tissues, but there clearly could be many other important immune uh, responses that need to be further elucidated. So several groups of ourselves, including, are looking into um, the role of autologous antibodies and T cells. And I think this and other innate effectors are gonna be important for us to understand the natural history of rebound and how we can modulate that effectively through cure strategies. I also think this really underscores how important this eclipse period, this very short period in the tissues between the waning of antiretrovirals and systemic virus replication. There's a lot of stuff going on in there. It's hard to figure out and we need sort of creative and um, resourceful experimental design to understand what's going on there. Uh, and I'll just say there's lots of other potential innate, or I'm sorry, uh, adaptive immune responses that could be um, further uh, explored. So in the next couple of minutes, I just wanted to talk about some of the ongoing work that we're doing in this area. And this is a little bit uh, more preliminary data, but hopefully it's interesting. So I think one of the most important things that we've seen so far is how universal this be. We have not seen a rebound participant yet with anything but highly resistant interferon, res uh, interferon or highly interferon resistant viruses. However, there are major caveats to the universality of the people we've studied. In particular, We've looked at about 25 different participants, and I think one of them was a woman. Um, and women are incredibly underrepresented in clinical trial, particularly HIV cure research. And um, we're hoping that the next wave of trials will really give us more interested women participants. Um, but this is a really important thing. There's a lot of different hormonal and interferon related uh, issues with women versus men, and we need to make sure that we study this group. We are also pretty biased in terms of the clade and geographic region of people that we are studying. And I also think when we're talking about innate immunity and inflammation, it's important to recognize that many people with living, living with HIV have comorbid condition, conditions, they have co-infections, they have tuberculosis, they have other things that could be really modulating these innate immune responses and changing, therefore, the selective pressures these viruses are, face, are facing. So that's an important thing to consider. Finally, I think that there are unique populations that we should be looking at. And the large one is acute art initiators because their reservoirs are far less diverse. The different um, clinical periods they've been through are distinct and it may be a really different um, proposition for those reservoir viruses to adapt and or for us to understand what those reservoir viruses. Um, so Tim Henrich has helped us with some unique participants and we're hopefully gonna study those soon. And we also have several collaborators with acute um, art initiator studies from the MHRP and the ACTG. And hopefully we can really dig into what do small reservoirs and acute art initiation, how does that look like? What does that look like in terms of interferon resistance of their various virus populations? So another important issue is I think that's often discussed at the sort of clinical level is what is the impact of reseeding? And we talked about the fact that our reservoirs hadn't changed very much over the course of the trial, but I think it's important to recognize that even in our first study, we identified two reservoir viruses from one participant, AO8, 
that were actually pretty resistant to type one interferons. They're very similar in alpha two and they're a little bit sort of intermediate in beta. And I think the more that we've dug into NO8, what we figured out is these are likely viruses that were very similar to rebound and reseeded the reservoir as a small fraction, but were detectable a year later when we sampled. So what is the um, frequency and the clinical implications for reseeding the reservoir with a phenotype of virus that's distinct from what we've sampled otherwise? So we've dug in this to a, uh, into this a little bit, and this is the participant AO8 that I was just speaking of. This is the range of viruses, and I apologize for changing the scale, but we have our pre-study reservoir viruses in green, and our post in blue, and our rebound in red. And in fact, we find two lineages where we have rebound viruses and post-ATI, so reservoir after the study viruses, that in envelope are very similar. Now, if we look at the full length viruses, there are actually distinctions. There's multiple amino acid differences, but they're still very close. And if we look at the, phenotypic, the phenotype of these viruses, some of these closely related reservoir viruses actually have intermediate or relatively high levels of interferon resistance. So there's another participant that we've, we've sequenced a little bit more in depth, and this is A13. And again, I got a different schema or you know, color scheme. I apologize for that. But what I can show you is two populations where we have post ATI reservoir samples that align with rebound viruses. And this suggests again that, re that reseeding may be more frequent. It's not a huge um, phenomenon, but it does happen. And it's important for us to recognize at what frequency and what are the implications of having these viruses reseeded after a short-term ATI. Another thing that I think is important for us to understand about these treatment interruptions is the kinetics of this interferon resistance over a prolonged ATI. So this is a historical study um, in a collaboration with the Worcester Institute that Luis Montaner conducted. And basically we have four individuals in whom their early ATI viruses are shown to be resistant to, um, to interferons. And if we look over this really prolonged ATI, we have some distant samples. So we're talking, you know, months after treatment interruption as the virus continues to replicate. And what you can see is over time, the resistance to interferon does wane. So that's not surprising, but I think this sort of zone in here and that sort of first few weeks um, and maybe first few months of ATI as viruses are replicating, that's really important for us to understand because that is what our modern or our more recent ATIs are gonna look like. We're gonna have four to 12 weeks of viremia as people are meeting our more um, sort of, uh, our less stringent a ART restart criteria. And it'd be nice to know how that interferon resistance changes over that time. So that's a real goal for this next wave of cure trials is us to understand how the kinetics of that interferon resistance over time. And that may have clinical implications as to what gets locked into the reservoir when we start antiretrovirals at any of those various time points. So back to this AO8 participant that has this really diverse reservoir. And I, this is a, an ability for us to look at what other virus phenotypes are linked to interferon resistance. So bear with me here, but in this individual, we characterized the interferon resistance to alpha two and to beta, but we looked at a few other phenotypes. And this is a very diverse virus population. This individual likely was infected for a long period of time prior to ART initiation. But we looked at tropism, so CCR5 versus CXCR4 tropism. And what we found across these viruses is that there is a range from purely R5 tropic to purely X4 tropic to dual tropic. And interestingly, it did not correlate at all with interferon resistance. So we had interferon resistant R5, interferon resistant X4, interferon sensitive R5, X4. So there was no correlation between that specifically. It would have been really nice if it had shown up as a clear relationship because that could have helped us understand a lot, but it didn't. So that is what it is. So next we, next we looked in replication and monocyte derived macrophages. And this is a huge area of study that I'm just gonna touch on very briefly. But the thought is, if these viruses are coming from a non-CD4 T cell reservoir, it is necessary, but not sufficient, that they would be able to replicate in macrophages. And so the first step would be, the first easy step, is do these viruses replicate well in monocyte-derived macrophages? And the fact is, in this one individual, we have a huge range of ability, of capacity to replicate in monocyte-derived macrophages, and I will show you that. Here, um, but over a large number of individuals, including AO8, we can see some viruses that replicate really well in macrophages and some that just don't. Um, but if we take our large number of rebound viruses across individuals and we compare them with 
sort of all the virus outgrowth transmit and a, and a select group of transmitted founder and um, chronic viruses, we can see there may be a slight uh, bias towards better replication and monocyte derived macrophages compared to these other groups, but it's not clear. And I think one of the projects that we're working on right now is trying to find a better model of macrophage replication. So we're collaborating with, some, with Kelly Jordan Shudo and Chala Espinoza at Penn to look at a, a model of tissue macrophages, because I think that's a really relevant model for where we think macrophage reservoirs may be, and that's in the, in the tissue department. So I think I'm over time. And I'll just say that this is a very exciting model that has lovely uh, verisimilitude with tissue macrophages. And, but I'm just gonna um, skip to the end and give acknowledgements because I don't want to uh, run over time too much. So I'll just say, first of all, this work is completely dependent on study participants and their altruism and dedication to the science. And so we really appreciate that. It's also an incredibly collaborative uh, group of work. I'm uh, dependent on my collaborations with George and B, as well as with multiple collaborators across different labs um, and the A5340 study team that sort of allowed all this to happen. And with that, I'll say thank you so much for the, your time and I would be excited to take any questions. Katie, that was terrific. Thanks so much. And, and, and everyone, please feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, um, uh, Steve, Steve Uckel, I saw you. Uh, Katie, that was a fabulous talk. Um, it's really striking to me how much higher the uh, interferon resistance is in the rebound virus. And so I was wondering, um, even though it's complicated because interferon is made within cells and uh, acts from other cells, but uh, do we know anything about the um, levels of interferon expression in different cell types or different tissues? that we think are reservoirs either just before ATI or just after ATI? And can we use those differences in interferon expression to sort of guess where these rebound viruses are coming from? That is a super good question. And the short answer is, I do not know that. <laughs> there may be others that know that. But I think this period of time, this clinical juncture, this the discerning what tissues are relevant for early virus reactivation at the specific time point of antiretroviral treatment interruption is really hard to study. I think this is a great system for a, a really uh, a strong and predictive animal model because you could potentially time your sort of tissue sampling with ART waning, et cetera. But to my knowledge in that specific context, it's not well known, but there may be biologists who have a better sense of that. Um, I, I do think that um, comparisons of transmission to virus reactivation at treatment interruption are fascinating as well in that regard, because there is a large body of work about the cytokine storm and the various innate immune responses that occur at the sites of mucosal transmission. And we can learn from that, but extrapolating when we see slight differences in that phenotype and potentially different ISGs or different you know, host restriction factors in the viral, I'm sorry, viral restriction factors that are at play, that's gonna be a really interesting part of teasing out sort of the determinants of virus resist, of interferon resistance in, these, in the context of rebound and how it overlaps and or differs from transmission. Great. Uh, next, uh, Michael Peluso. Hey, Katie, that, that was great. Um, I have a, I wanted to ask a little bit about broadly neutralizing antibodies and um, uh, what we learned from studying the reservoir for BNAB susceptibility. Um, so for a lot of our clinical trials, we um, look at PBMCs and do genotyping and try to infer whether individuals will be um, susceptible to BNABs, but um, if, the, if it's really the reservoir that uh, kind of is uh, formed at the time of art initiation, um, that's more relevant, should we be looking at kind of that time point if we have it available for inferring BNAB susceptibility, or is there a better way to think about eligibility for these studies that involve BNABs? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and um, I've worked with you on some of these things and I, I think it's a really thorny issue how we pre-screen for these studies. 
Um, so to address your question, so first of all, a lot of work has shown that these that the the virus outgrowth assays during the reservoir closely align or are biased towards those viruses circulating at the time of art initiation. So I think that's a strong connection and that makes a lot of sense. And if you wanted to sample the reservoir, you could sample that reservoir and you could sample those late replicating viruses and they should be similar. But what I am concerned about is the fact that there's actually those viruses may not be fully relevant to what actually reactivates. Um, now, that all that being said, if you find in the reservoir frank resistance to your BNAB of choice, that is likely predictive that that antibody will not work. They're not; These viruses are not so distinct that they're gonna lose all of the shared phenotypes. But there may be subtle differences that no sampling of blood or cell, blood cells can really help us elucidate. Great. I, th I think uh, Satish is next. Hi. Awesome talk. Um, quick question. I think I'm, go I'm going to ask you about some of the slides that you had to gloss over at the end there. But um, uh, to me, the most uh, fascinating you know, question that evolves from your story is um, what is the virus doing to, to evade resistance? And are there any shared signatures in the interferon resistant viruses or you know, since interferon itself um, can act through so many different effector mechanisms, that diversity could also be reflected in the viruses that, that evade it. But so what, what's the latest intel on, on um, the, the viral determinants of resistance against interferon? Yeah, so I think your last statement there was really what I will try to um, hit that like interferon is such a multimodal response that our ISGs at any one context that could be upregulated with interferons are many, and the virus um, genes at play to defend against them are also many. In the work that we've done so far, sort of mapping the determinants within the virus of, um, of interferon resistance, we have identified a few viruses from transmitted founder viruses compared with matched um, sort of chronic viruses. So we'd like to use these sort of nearly isogenic viruses that are, that are very similar, but have only a small number of amino acid differences. And then we can sort of map which ones are specifically conferring that phenotype. And in that work, we've seen that, you know, we've identified some areas in VIF, we've identified some um, mutations in NEF, and um, they are, in one instance shared between two unrelated viruses, but for the most part, very much context dependent to that specific virus. And so what we've seen so far in a limited amount of work is that we can identify and we can map phenotypic interferon resistance, but it is not um, a universal thing across viruses. And I think that reflects the, the multi, like the many different facets of the interferon response. So we're starting to do that now because in our rebound viruses, like in that AO8 participant, we have um, a rebound virus and a reservoir virus that have a really distinct phenotype that are closely related, so we can map those. We're also working with um, Michael Emmerman with this sort of unbiased CRISPR-based screen to identify which, which ISGs are likely um, affecting that difference in interferon resistance per these different viruses um, in, a, in a cell culture um, format. But that work is very early. My guess is we're gonna identify a bunch of things and it's gonna be, our goal is to assess trends or commonalities, but it's not gonna be one clear silver bullet answer in either transmission or rebound as a content. And when you test interferon resistance um, in the lab, are, are you always doing this like in autologous CD4 cells from the patients or? No, it's not autologous CD4 okay. T cells, but it's always oh. CD4 T cells. Um, so, you know, that is a, we, we rarely have access to autologous CD4 T cells from a person living with HIV. So we use sort of healthy donor cells. Yeah, I'm wondering if the target cell type there too might, might be a determinant of the interferon resistance that you observe. I think that's a really important point because obviously the, the interferon response we're seeing, what we're seeing is a difference in that cell. We treat the cells with interferons. We see those, inter those cells change because of that interferon treat treatment and the cells that we're using are relevant. So we use mixtures of cells from multiple donors to try to offset that. But there's, I think a lot of devil in the details in terms of the amount of interferon stimulation you're giving, the time course of that infection, you know, all of those things are very relevant as to which ISGs are, are important in manifesting that sort of global phenotype of resistance or sensitivity to interferons. Thank you. So, um, Sugi, we're a little bit over time. So, if you can ask a very short question, we can probably get it in. If not, we may put it in the chat, and then 
uh, and or have an email discussion with Kate. Sure, that's going to be hard because I was like, oh my God, there's so many questions I have. So I'll try to <laughs> ask Peter, you can cut me off. Katie, Thanks. that was an amazing talk. Um, and you. so as someone working on host genetics and also clinical translational HIV, um, I guess I'll whittle it down to, you know, your summary slide where you said sort of these two potential mechanisms um, that could be, you know, contributing to the data you showed. And the one that's really interesting to me was this, the second one, I think Satish was talking about it too, about intense select pressure. Um, <clears throat> First of all, just put in a quick plug. We have this awesome acute HIV core here that we are done enrolling. That's like 69 patients with monthly visits. <clears throat> so I'd love oh. to talk to you offline about that. Might be related to some of the samples you're getting from Tim too. But, um, but I think um, what I wanted to ask you is, you know, I know you work primarily in virology, but you know, what your thoughts are and how this second mechanism ties into what we're seeing and learning about HIV integration and the persistence of clones um, during ART suppression and what happens upon ATI. Um, to me, even the work you're showing with the macrophage stuff is so interesting because it suggests that there's you know, potentially this pressure. And again, there may be something going on with like, for example, the cytokine milieu, and maybe the macrophages are playing a big role in contributing to that. So testing things in a Petri dish versus getting, you know, in vivo samples to be able to answer some of these questions might tell us quite a bit in terms of what's happening um, at the time of rebound. I do think compartmentalization is really key too. And I think Karine Dubé's question is, is the answer is yes, tissue, <laughs> tissue is great. Um, but, but I think, can you speak a little bit briefly about like whether you've thought about how this intersects with some of the research coming out in terms of HIV integrated clones that persist over time or what, you know, whether you're doing any work related to that? Yeah, so I think that, uh, well, first of all, thank you all. That was super, very, a bunch of very much, very interesting stuff. And I'll just try to focus <laughs> on your question. Um, so the work, in the persistence of the reservoir and how relevant clonal expansion, be that antigen driven or uh, homeostatic proliferation, whatever it is, that's super important. And I think that accounts for maybe, you know, between 60 and 90% of the reservoir, but every one of those large expanded clones that's a dominant component in any one of those individuals, there's also lots and lots of other reservoir viruses that comprise the diversity of that reservoir, be those clones that are circulating you know, within the blood so that we can sample them with our current methods or ones that are stuck in tissue somewhere or ones that are resident in some other tissue that, you know, we aren't able to access. So I think that the large storyline for why the reservoir persists and maintains itself is super important and clonal proliferation explains a lot of that. But underneath all of that, there's minor variants that are also important because they may contribute either as viruses that are rebound competent and, re and rebounding themselves or as sort of um, tinder for recombination or for activation that then spurs other viruses to be able to reactivate within that context or cytokines to drive pressures, et cetera. So these minor variants that are very challenging to sample in the reservoir, I think are also really relevant to the phenotypes and the, the, the way we think about sort of a complete curative strategy approach. Okay, great. Uh, thanks so much, Katie, uh, for a really thought-provoking uh, presentation. It obviously stimulated tons of discussion. You've got even more uh, questions in the chat to, okay. to go through. If you can stay on for a few minutes to address them in the chat, that's great, if not by yeah. email. Uh, and then um, we'll turn it over now to um, Steve Uckel, who's going to, uh, for the next hour, uh, uh, present the organize the science spotlight uh, on the VA. Uh, so Steve, take it away. And sorry to be a few minutes late. No problem. Let me share my screen here. Uh, so I'm just gonna speak for a minute or two about HIV research at the San Francisco VA. Um, so the San Francisco VA has a very robust HIV research program that spans the full spectrum from basic to clinical research. Uh, HIV research here is conducted by investigators in multiple divisions, not just infectious diseases, but also endocrinology, cardiology, nephrology, lab medicine, and other divisions. Our investigators are currently funded through the NIH, the VA, the state of California, and other entities. And much of our research is cross-campus and collaborative. Uh, our study participants include veterans as well as non-veterans, and both of these groups are enrolled in various cohorts, such as Max Wise and SCOPE. Um, 
And our investigators are currently active in multiple different fields of HIV research. And so my only slide here, I'm just gonna show you some of the areas of HIV, HIV research that VA people here are studying. Uh, these include HIV latency and persistence, HIV neuropathogenesis, virtually every other organ comorbidity, co-infection with hepatitis C, HIV in women, uh, extracellular vesicles. And on this slide, I've also listed some of the last names of uh, investigators who are currently funded and active in these areas of research and housed at the VA. But for today, we're gonna to have three talks that span at least three of these different fields. Uh, and with that, I'll move on to our first speaker, who is uh, Dr. Sanyog Chatoye. He's an assistant professor uh, and is gonna to talk to us about HIV-associated cardiac dysfunction in women. Uh, so go ahead, um, Sanyog. Thanks a lot. So uh, let me share my screen. Is the uh, slide presentation visible? Yep. All right. Yes. Yeah. So thanks a lot for the opportunity uh, to speak about this project. And so the, the topic of my talk is uh, association of HIV infection with adverse cardiac phenotypes in women. And uh, uh, we used data from the Women's Interagency HIV Study, which is, which is now a part of a combined max wise which is the multi center AIDS cohort study, which is specifically in men, and then WISE, which is specifically in women. It's combined together by NHLBI to, to, to now have the MWCCS. So for this project, I used data only from the WISE. And so the study PI is Dr. Kaiser, who's also my uh, mentor. Uh, so by way of introduction, which I guess uh, we now know this, it's, it's now a well-established uh, fact is that with the advent of antiretroviral therapy, life expectancy in people living with HIV is approaching that of the general population. So this is a very beautiful figure from a paper that came out last month in Annals of Internal Medicine, which shows one-year mortality, two-year mortality, and five-year mortality in persons entering HIV care and matched US population. And we can see that the life expectancy, uh, so here we can see that the mortality is decreasing, so it's, it's approaching the matched US population. Uh, but along with that has come the increase in chronic disease burden. And uh, the, 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 uh, previous reports have shown elevated risk of uh, cardiovascular disease burden in different forms, in different manifestations, including myocardial infarction, heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, as well as atrial fibrillation in persons living with HIV. Uh, so what is lacking? So uh, many of those reports that have come out have lacked well-matched control groups. And then most of the evidence is uh, in men. And then, uh, 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 some of the cardiac dysfunction reports that have come out, specifically diastolic dysfunction, they have been using the previous American uh, Society of Echocardiography guidelines. The latest one was the more stringent ones that came out in 2016. So it's important to, uh, uh, to, to look at the assessment of uh, echo outcomes using the latest guidelines. And then there is a dearth of data from race ethnic minority groups as well in the literature. So with those uh, knowledge gaps in mind, I'm gonna present the results from this project. So the study design is cross-sectional and uh, the data is from WISE, uh, which is now part of MWCCS. And so previously WISE, uh, when it was an independent entity, there was a core visit every six months. And now there is a core visit annually with the combined MWCCS platform. So, uh, so the story begins with a pilot study in just the Bronx site of WISE, uh, where the PI was Dr. Kaiser back in 2014, which was uh, with additional funding from NHLBI was expanded to Bronx and Brooklyn sites. And then with the ECHO supplement from NIH, it was expanded to all the uh, rest of the eight sites in WISE. And so all active WISE participants in all the 10 sites were invited for echocardiographic assessment. Uh, so, uh, so the assessment involved two-dimensional M-mode, color and spectral Doppler imaging in parasternal, apical, subcostal, and suprasternal views, transmitral Doppler imaging at leaflet tips, 
and then tissue Doppler imaging at septal and lateral mitral annulus in the heart. And the echocardiographic outcomes of interest, the five primary outcomes I'm going to talk about is, so the first one is left ventricular systolic dysfunction, defined as left ventricular ejection fraction less than 54%. Isolated left ventricular diastolic dysfunction defined by the latest American Society of Echocardiography guidelines. Then left atrial enlargement defined as left atrial volume index wherein it's indexed to the body surface area of, of the person. Uh, so the, the cutoff is more than 34 milliliters per meter square. Left ventricular hypertrophy defined as left ventricular mass index more than 95 grams per meter square. Again, indexed to body surface area. And then pulmonary hypertension, which is for, for, the, for, for this purpose is defined as a peak tricuspid regurgitation velocity more than 2.8 meters per second. So I'm gonna, give, try, I'm gonna try to give a brief primer in one line for each of the five outcomes so that uh, uh, we can try to understand it better. So the left ventricular systolic dysfunction uh, is defined as left ventricular ejection fraction less than 54%, meaning that less than 54% of the total uh, blood that is the so out of the total blood that comes in in the left ventricle during diastole, less than 54% is pumped out uh, during systole. Uh, we, and that is a precursor, roughly a precursor for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Similarly, LV diastolic dysfunction is when the ejection fraction is maintained, but the left ventricular chamber is becomes fibrosed or stiffened. And that phenotype is a precursor for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Similarly, left, left atrial enlargement has been previously shown to be a reliable indicator of increased uh, left ventricular filling pressure and volume overload. And left ventricular hypertrophy has been uh, shown to be associated with increased overall cardiovascular mortality in general population cohorts. And uh, uh, for, for measuring pulmonary hypertension on echo, using the threshold of peak TR velocity more than 2.8 is sufficient enough for po population studies, but a clinical confirmation is done by a right heart catheterization. So for our purposes, we'll be using this operational definition. So those are the outcomes of interest. So here is the, so uh, this table describes the study population of this cross-sectional design. Uh, so the active vice participants underwent echocardiograms from 2014 up to 2019 at all the 10 Y sites and all the covariates are at that particular visit, uh, at the six month visit when they got the echocardiogram. So, uh, and I, we are looking at the different groups by the HIV status, wherein the women living with HIV are on the left and without HIV are on the right. And so the total uh, sample is uh, 1,654 and roughly 70% are women living with HIV and the rest are without HIV. So uh, age is slightly higher in women living with HIV. Similarly, the so, uh, so, so this is a known uh, uh, covariate in Ys, which speaks to how the matched control, uh, so the, ma the, the, the controls are drawn from the same communities from where the HIV, uh, women living with HIV come from. And so that's why the current smoker we see, there is actually a higher proportion in women living without HIV. Similar is the case for heavy alcohol use. And we also see a history of heroin or cocaine use to be higher in women living without HIV. And then as expected, history of HCV seropositivity is higher in women living with HIV. Uh, moving on to clinical uh, parameters, slightly higher systolic blood pressure in women living without HIV. Uh, dyslipidemia as expected, uh, that, so the association with antiretroviral therapy has been uh, shown by previous reports. And so higher dyslipidemia proportion in women living with HIV. And, uh, high, and but hi, higher history, small but self-reported higher history of MI in women living without HIV. And then looking at the HIV specific factors, I would like to point out the small number of categories in CD4 less than 200, which is only 52, and then about 10%, uh, less than 10%, about uh, so 9% women uh, who are not on antiretroviral therapy. Uh, 
And then I, I have also included here the cumulative use in number of years for different ART drug classes, entry inhibitor, INSTEs, NRTI, NRTI, and PI use. So moving on to the outcomes, uh, this is just a rough uh, unadjusted uh, proportion of outcomes uh, by HIV status and uh, roughly comparable. Uh, so a higher systolic dysfunction in women living with HIV 5.4% versus 3.5%, and then a slightly higher isolated diastolic dysfunction in women living without HIV. Similarly, uh, uh, I've shown the proportions of LA enlargement, left ventricular hypertrophy, and peak TI velocity more than 2.8 meters per second. So uh, we decided to uh, pursue relative risk regression based on a POSO working model with a log link function and robust standard errors. Our three models, so we, we, we added covariates based on known biology and previous literature. Model one adjusted for age, race, ethnicity, the site, and reader. Model two, Additionally, adjusted for BMI, smoking status, heavy alcohol use, history of injection drug use, history of heroin or cocaine use, and HCV status. And then model three, additionally adjusted for hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, history of MI, history of heart failure, and uh, EGFR. So we considered model two to be our main model because model three uh, includes some putative, some partial causal intermediates. And so for our purposes, we considered model two results to be the, the, main, the main model and the main findings. Uh, so moving on to the main results. So if you look at the outcomes by HIV status, we see that uh, there is a near significant 1.7 times increased uh, risk of left ventricular systolic dysfunction in uh, the uh, women living with HIV as compared to women living without HIV. Other than that, uh, there is no noticed associ uh, significant association for the rest of the four outcomes on sequential adjustment. And then uh, when we look at HIV associated factors, we notice that uh, there is a 1.9 times increased risk when compared to women living without HIV in the undetectable viral load group uh, as compared to the detectable viral, so as compared to so the HIV negative group. And then uh, there is a 1.6 times in the detectable viral load group as compared to the women living without HIV. Uh, similarly, uh, so uh, as noticed in the, in, the, in the previous table for the overall HIV group, there were no other significant findings noticed for any of the other four outcomes. When we look at CD4 count, uh, we notice that for left atrial enlargement, there is a 1.5 fold increased risk in model two for uh, CD4 count less than 200 as compared to the women living without HIV. Uh, there is a three fold increased risk for uh, left ventricular hypertrophy and roughly 2.3 times increased risk for uh, peak TR velocity more than 2.8. Uh, then when we look at the anti antiretroviral therapy use, we notice that there is a 1.8 times increased risk for women who are on antiretroviral therapy as compared to women without HIV. And there is no uh, significant finding for women who are not on ART. But I want to make a point here is that, so already the event proportion is low. And within that, the proportion of no art is also a much smaller group. So we see a very wide confidence interval here. So I don't know how much, how much, what to think of, and how much to, how much to put stock in this particular uh, finding, this particular uh, result out here. Uh, but we definitely see a 1.8 times increase risk in women who are on art. So that makes us uh, interested in looking at the different art drug classes and their association. Other than that, we do not see a significant finding in other any of the four outcomes for art versus no art, where HIV negative women is a different group. Uh, so this is a busy slide, and I'm sorry about that. But I have I have uh, here the I have tried to show the relative risk per year of cumulative use of a particular art drug class, and this is only in the HIV positive participants. And uh, here we notice uh, so. 
roughly overall, we do not find a significant finding. So for example, here we see a 8% increased risk for uh, uh, that's a, uh, a dysfunction by insta use, but then in model three, it goes away. Similarly, here there is a reduced risk for NNRTI use per year for diastolic dysfunction, and it continues to stay in model three as well, a 6% uh, reduced risk. Uh, so what are the conclusions so far? So uh, HIV infection was near significantly associated with left ventricular systolic dysfunction, about 1.7 times increased risk. Undetectable viral load was 1.9 times and detectable was 1.6 times increased risk of left ventricular systolic dysfunction. And then immunosuppressed uh, HIV, which is CD4 count less than 200, had a 1.5 times increased risk of left atrial enlargement, three times increased risk of left ventricular hypertrophy, and 2.3 times increased risk of pulmonary hypertension. So this is a figure uh, from a, a paper that came out last year which shows the different factors at play in an HIV setting when we are interested in cardiovascular disease outcomes. And I wanted to kind of point out to uh, the, the difficulties involved in teasing out the association of HIV infection with, with uh, uh, cardiovascular disease outcomes in a setting where there are all these different factors at play. For example, antiretroviral therapy, uh, behavioral factors, including smoking and alcohol use, then traditional cardiovascular disease risk factors, all are, all are at play. Uh, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, high BMI, uh, then the, the usual culprits in an HIV setting, immune activation, inflammation, all these leading to different manifestations of cardiovascular disease outcomes and uh, uh, Along with that, a depression, then co-infection by hepatitis C. Cytomegalovirus has been shown in a general population setting to also increase the risk of cardiovascular disease outcomes. So it, it, larger studies, well-powered studies are required to tease out the association and the pathways involved in an HIV setting where cardiovascular disease outcome is of interest. Uh, so future steps, we plan on examining association with strain data from the uh, echo imaging, which is a continuous, more sensitive outcome. So which will give us more power to detect the differences. Uh, and then additional steps in MWCCS, uh, we will be repeating echoes uh, in, on an average five years from baseline scans. And then there is a, there are also, work is also underway to harmonize the echo data in Max and Wise by cross reads and using AI techniques at the Hopkins lab. And then we, as a part of the Bronx Brooklyn study, we have also conducted cardiac magnetic resonance in a subset of the population for which analysis is underway. And then we also have a pilot study underway to uh, look at uh, coronary CT and geographies in, in, the, in the Bronx site. Uh, assessment of relations to adjudicated clinical CVD outcomes is also currently in progress in MWCCS. So with that, it, it takes a great team of people to do such vast kind of work. So thanks to my mentors, Dr. Kaiser and Dr. Tian, and other collaborators, uh, Dr. Kaplan, Dr. Lima, and uh, vice participants and site PIs and staff. With that, these are my references. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to do, uh, take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sanyog. That was a terrific talk. Um, in the interest of time, I think the questions are gonna to have to be through the chat. So I think we're gonna move on to our second speaker, uh, who's Dr. Bing Sun. He's a staff scientist and is gonna to talk to us about his research on extracellular vesicles. Uh, Bing, go ahead and start sharing your screen. All right. Um, can you see the slides? We can see them, yes. Okay. You're speaking a little soft. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, today I'll talk about uh, our recent studies on iPSC monocytes, uh, EVs in humanized 
mice. Um, IPSCs have been used um, in studies for many disease models, and IPSC EVs have been uh, used to repair lesions uh, and reported safer and more effective in cardiac repair. Um, IPSC EVs also used as uh, vehicles to, to transport therapeutic agents to target cells. And we are interested in using the EVs as a therapeutic tool for neural HIV. Uh, we all know that a monocyte uh, target, um, monocytes migrate into the CNS in early stage of uh, HIV infection. Uh, we used to use primary monocytes EVs, but monocytes, uh, the problem is there's a, a variation between donor to donor. Uh, so the IPSC is a better choice for reproducibility. Uh, we also found that uh, EVs tend to get into similar cells like monocyte EVs into monocytes. Uh, so in this study, we used IPSC-derived monocyte EVs in the uh, HIV mouse model in the hope of targeting neural inflammation in HIV. Uh, we have two questions to answer. Can we alter HIV inflammation with monocyte stem cell extracellular vesicles? And can we target inflammation by silencing microRNA-155 associated pro-inflammation? We obtained the uh, uh, IPSC derived monocyte from ATCC, cultured for two days, and uh, the EVs are collected uh, with exocrypt PC. Um, IPSC monocytes remained CD14 positive and 60, uh, 68, 16 negative um, after seven days in culture. Uh, for characterization, we found uh, uh, the EVs are around 133 nanometers, um, show the donut like shape in the EM, and they carry CD63, CD81, and 9 tetraspanners, um, which are characteristic for uh, extracellular vesicles. In our previous studies, we found a uh, uh, microRNA 155 increase in HIV patient monocyte EVs. Uh, we also found a uh, uh, 155 increased in activated monocyte, primary monocyte EVs. And when we put these activated EVs onto microvesicular endothelial cells, the target cells also expressed increased more 155. Uh, luckily, we, uh, during the pandemic, we have access to the HIV mouse model. Uh, this model utilized um, immunodeficient mice and transplanted with fetal liver thymus and bone marrow um, and reconstructed human hematopoietic system. And so that uh, HIV can be replicated in this model. Uh, we have six groups um, for uh, after HIV injection, plain uh, IPSC EVs or anti-135 or scrambled um, microRNA transfected EVs will be injected. Um, after um, verification of human PBMC reconstitution after 12 weeks of uh, the transplantation, uh, the H um, mice were in, uh, infected with HIV. The EVs were then injected at day seven and day 10. Uh, the mice are sacrificed at, after two weeks of in, uh, HIV infection. We found the mouse plasma HIV viral load uh, at a decent level. Um, and have no change um, at day six and day 14 between our negative groups. We then verified PBMC activation after HIV infection. Uh, we found percent CCR5 um, and HLA-DR increase on CD4 and CD8 T cells. Also CD, percent CD16 increased in monocytes and microphages. With these findings, we confirm that HIV mouse model is working. Uh, in the plain EV group, we found percent monocyte and macrophage decrease, uh, and percent CCR5 increase on monocytes and macrophage and in intermediate monocytes. Um, and the increase to CCR5 uh, may indicate a higher mobility and greater chance to migrate into the brain. And then we found uh, percent CCR5 and uh, uh, HIV-DR decreased um, on CD4 and CD8 T cells. Uh, 
And then we look at the cargo of the EVs um, for a few of the information associated microRNAs, including uh, 146A, 155, 222, and 223. And they all um, exist in the EVs. And then we transfected the EVs with anti more 155, um, and it was successful, as show, shown here. As a result, um, <clears throat> We found the uh, anti mer 135 decreased percent CCR5 on monocytic and macrophages, uh, which may indicate a decrease of mobility and less migration into the brain. Um, we and other groups have found that HIV can increase interferon induced genes. A, Scott, uh, a study by a uh, Scott group at UCLA uh, showed that uh, increased uh, interferon inferon-induced genes, IMX1 and OSS1, uh, and can be suppressed by anti-interferon receptor antibodies. Um, but in this study, we didn't see suppression of interferon-induced genes by anti mer 5 EVs. Um, but in summary, we had a successful HIV mouse model uh, playing IPSC EVs suppressed T cell activation, um, but it's divergent from monocyte and macrophage activation. Anti MER155 EVs reversed this um, activation, but not through interferon pathway. And also, decreased CCR5 activ activation on um, monocyte and macrophages should decrease migration to the brain. And we are still in the middle of the processing the sections. Um, finally, I will acknowledge um, my PI input, Dr. Colin um, and Arshana Gupta for uh, the anti-microRNAs, Scott Kitchen at UCLA for our mouse model, um, Sheila Jacob at ATCC providing us with the IPS monocytes and NH family. Um, thank you. That's it. Um, great. Thank you very much, Ping. That was a wonderful talk. And I'll open it up to questions. Yeah, Bing, I have a question. This is Philip Norris here. Were there any clinical effects in the mouse, mice from these uh, um, administration of the EVs? Um, clinical effects, you mean their behavior or? Yeah, and their, their neuro HIV symptoms. No, that, that I don't know, because the uh, it's, it, it was the Scott lab at USI hosting the, the housing the mice, and we had no chance to look at them. Um, and we didn't receive any report of behavior change with these mice. OK, thanks. Uh, other questions? I can't necessarily see everybody. So go ahead if you have uh, another question. Uh, if, if not, Bing, I have a question for you. Do, do you think the, the effects of your um, extracellular vesicles are mediated by miRNAs in them? Is, is that what you think is going on? Uh, no, I'm not sure. Because the, uh, the cargo of the EVs are very complex. Um, um, on top of the microRNAs, there are also other like uh, protein cargos. Uh, so I'm not sure what, what is the effect of for these. Um, out of curiosity, do you happen to know the, the proteins that are carried uh, in, in these extracellular vesicles that you administered? No, we, we didn't have a chance to um, profile either protein or microRNA. Hi, this is Lynn. Um, I think those are really good questions, Steve. And the, the problem is, is that we didn't get very many of these monocyte stem cells. Um, unfortunately, um, they were, they're really expensive. And we were doing this as a pilot study with ATCC to see um, these monocytic um, stem cells. So they're very expensive, they're hard to do. The reason we did it is because when we tried to make um, monocyte um, EVs, they were variable between patients. And when you do, we, we started out with hex cell EVs and it turns out hex cell EVs don't like to go to monocytes. 
so you know it's this mono to mono and that would make sense um, that we would want to target the monocyte macrophage because that goes into the brain and we're interested in decreasing peripheral inflammation and therefore decreasing um, brain inflammation. So we did decrease CCR5 and HLA on T cells and we um, decreased CCR5 on, on monocyte macrophages, but I don't know if this model, this humanized mouse model is gonna be good enough to show a decrease in migration if there is, you know, if you can see macrophages going, human macrophages going into the mouse brain. But the idea, it's a good idea in the sense you wanna decrease inflammation using something like an EV that uh, could be targeted. So that was the point. Is there time for one more quick question? Uh, sure, go ahead, Satish. Thanks. Uh, Bing, great talk. A quick question for you about um, uh, your mon I'm sorry, your EV isolation um, uh, protocol and what potential impact that has. So, you know, one thing I always wonder about the, um, the SBI uh, exoquick method is it's like a polymer based capture approach to, um, to isolate the EVs, you know, as opposed to using something like ultracentrifugation. So if you're doing like downstream functional work with, with um, EVs that are isolated using polymers, are, are you worried that the residual polymer and that uh, isolation protocol would affect any of the, the phenotypes you'd register downstream or do you think that's not a concern? We, we haven't done a, um, a thorough experiment comparing um, polymer without polymer. Um, so I think it is a concern and we are actually um, have um, other um, projects um, like with the more uh, immunoprecipitation type of purification. Yeah. Um, and, but that's still um, in process. Yeah. I just wondered, like, I think for, um, you know, characterizing cargo, like doing microRNA analyses and stuff, it seems like the SBI methods are very convenient. But sometimes I do scratch my head about the, the phenoty phenotypic um, yes, yes. impact. But thank you. Uh, great. Thank you very much, Bing. Um, I think in the interest of time, we'll move on. Uh, our third speaker is Dr. Sushama Telwat, who is currently in the process of being promoted to assistant professor, and she's going to talk to us about some of the cellular factors involved in latent HIV infections. Go ahead, Sushama. I'll just wait for Bing to stop sharing. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, Bing, please stop sharing. Yep. <laughs> no, no problem. Okay, just pull up my slides now. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my slides. Um, thank you, Steve, for the introduction. Um, so I'll just uh, get straight into it. So today I'll be describing a project that was supported by CIFA um, by a mentored scientist in HIV ward. Now, as this audience is acutely aware, despite ART, uh, HIV persists in latently infected CD4 T cells, and it's considered to be a major barrier to a cure. Multiple molecular mechanisms have been associated with HIV latency, and I've listed some here. And importantly, we think that um, blocks to HIV transcription are also particularly important in maintaining HIV latency. Additionally, numerous uh, cellular factors have been implicated in the establishment and maintenance of HIV latency. However, it remains unclear which cellular factors are most important. And finally, um, current latency uh, reversing agents are ineffective in reversing blocks to HIV transcription. So for this particular study, we uh, wanted to identify which cellular factors are associated with latently infected um, cells at the single cell level. And the approach we opted to use was a Fluidine's Biomark HD platform, which is um, a system that uses microfluidics to partition single cell um, cDNA into reaction chambers for qPCR. And the instrument itself can perform qPCR on up to 96 different cells, as well as up to 96 different genes can be assessed, uh, which equates to over 9,200 simultaneous reactions that can be performed per chip. 
So we selected a panel of 88 cellular genes that have been previously reported to be associated with either HIV infection, HIV latency or um, transcription, as well as antiviral responses to HIV. Additionally, we included in this panel uh, eight HIV targets, which included the um, transcription profiling assays developed in-house in the UCOL lab um, that we adapted for this protocol, as well as two additional assays developed in the Silicano lab that are designed to detect intact proviruses, which are targets for envelope and the gag region. So since it's, it's technically very challenging to enrich and isolate HIV infected cells from infected um, uh, participants with HIV, we selected three prominent primary cell models of HIV latency to study. And uh, the reason for selecting three different models was that um, each primary cell model differs in the virus employed, the target cells, infection conditions and methods by which you can uh, distinguish latently infected cells from uninfected cells. And um, so I'll briefly describe some of the key features of the primary cell models. So the first uh, model that we selected was the wild type model, which was originally developed in uh, Vicente Fernandez's lab and further modified in Alberto Bosque's lab, which fe features a replication competent wild type virus. The second model, the, which we've named the resting cell model, was um, a model that was mod it's a modified version of Uno O'Doherty's model that uh, uses resting cells along with a reporter virus from the Green Lab. And um, with, the, with help from the Green Lab, we actually were able to generate this model in both blood and tonsil CD4 T cells. And the final model was the dual reporter model, um, which was developed in Eric Burden's lab. And here the virus features uh, two um, reporters, which enable us to distinguish between um, productive, latent and uninfected cells. So here's just an overview of our experimental design. And we and our collaborators cultured infected, infected cells um, uh, as um, prescribed by each of these um, uh, primary cell models. And for each model, we had two individual donors. Uh, from there, single cells were sorted into 96 wall plates, and we then performed a qPCR-based pre-screen, and this is prior to the, the biomark, um, and essentially this pre-screen enabled us to identify which individual cells were HIV infected. Uh, from there, cells from each population for each model were selected, and this included uh, latently infected cells, productively infected, as well as uninfected cell populations, which were then loaded onto the biomark chip, which I show here, along with our panel of gene expression assays, and then run on the biomark instrument shown here in number four. And from there, we performed bioinformatic analyses to determine which genes were differentially expressed in latently infected cells. So I'll use the wild type uh, virus model uh, as an example in the interest of time. And essentially, when we looked at um, HIV expression in individual cells, which are shown here by the vertical lines in this heat map, and I'll just um, highlight that the different colors represent um, the different uh, populations of cells. So purple being um, the latent populations for the two different donors, the blue and the greens being um, uh, several um, uninfected populations. And so overall, what we see is uh, in terms of um, poly A expression, so we had two HIV um, RNA specific um, targets in our in our um, assay panel, and this included poly A and TATREV. So I'll, I'll just show those here. Um, so in poly A, we see that um, this transcript is detected or expressed in most of um, the cells that are characterized as latent. And this differs from what we see in um, patient cells. Uh, in contrast, for TATREV expression, we see very few latently infected cells expressing TATREV, which tends to be more consistent with our observations in ex vivo cells from um, people living with HIV. So 
within each model, we looked at the degree of correlation between the cellular factors, which are shown here in the uh, columns on this heat map that I'm showing, uh, relative to um, HIV RNA transcripts, RNA specific transcripts, poly A and TETREV, which are shown in the rows. In this analysis, we can see that there are both some similarities and differences in the factors that are associated with um, HIV poly A and TAREV expression. Next, when we looked at the, um, the differentially expressed genes, in this particular model, um, we saw that um, three genes were differentially expressed and um, relative to uninfected uh, cells. In the latently uh, infected cell population, we saw an upregulation of BCL6 and HLA-DR and a downregulation of STAT1. In the next model, the resting cell model, um, we found in um, the blood CD4 T cells, only one gene was differentially expressed between latently infected cells and the uninfected populations. And this was CDK13, where um, we saw a downregulation in latently infected cells. In contrast, in the same model, but using tonsil CD4 T cells, we see um, many more differentially expressed genes. And these uh, genes encompassed various transcription factors, immune checkpoint markers, T cell function associated genes, um, as well as HIV targets um, that differed between the productively infected population, which were distinguished by N-cherry expression, um, compared to latently infected cells, which were M-cherry negative and un uh, uninfected cells. So next, uh, I'm showing the data for um, our dual reporter virus model. And here um, we see that there were a number of cellular factors that were associated with um, HIV RNA expression, particularly in the productively um, infected cell populations, which are shown on the top rows. And when we look at the differentially expressed genes, we see, um, again, similar to the resting cell model in the tonsils, we saw uh, a number of differentially expressed genes that distinguished um, latently infected cells from productive and from late, uh, sorry, uninfected populations. So um, essentially uh, what I've shown so far is that we were able to narrow down um, up list of 88 cellular factors down to um, 13 HIV latency associated targets that we think uh, may represent druggable targets. And so we next wanted to validate these targets. So we perform proof of concept experiments uh, using three, um, using inhibitors for three of the identified cellular factors that we think are important in HIV latency. And so briefly, um, the three targets that we selected were BCL6, for which we had a selective inhibitor called FX1, uh, BCL2, for which we used a pan inhibitor, Abataclax, and uh, CDK13, for which we had a selective inhibitor um, called THC531. And uh, we recruited six ART suppressed participants for whom we isolated PBMC. Um, cells were treated with these inhibitors for 24 hours in the presence of ARVs to prevent spreading infection. And from there, we um, isolated, uh, harvested and extracted HIV DNA and RNA and measured the HIV RNA expression profile as well as measuring HIV DNA levels. So um, as I'm sure this audience is, is aware, um, the Yuko Lab developed this transcription profiling approach. So I won't go into, into this technique in detail, but essentially um, the uh, transcription profiling method um, involves a panel of RT droplet digital PCR assays that measure different types of uh, mechanistically important transcripts produced by HIV to provide uh, insight into the progression through stages of HIV transcription, as shown in this schematic. And um, here, this includes the, in the initiated or total transcripts, five prime elongated, mid elongated or unspliced transcripts polyadenylated and multiply spliced. So um, the first uh, cellular factor that we validated was BCL2. And 
In our primary cell model work, we found that BCL2 was upregulated in latently infected cells, particularly in the dual reporter model. Um, previous studies have shown that um, BCL2 expression is linked to um, survival of um, HIV infected CD4 T cells and resistance to CTL, kill CTL mediated killing. So here I'm showing the um, expression of four mechanistically important HIV transcripts, which are elongated, unspliced, completed, and multiply spliced. Um, <clears throat> this is from six participants who were treated with the BCL2 inhibitor abataclax relative to DMSO, which is a uh, negative control. And the data is expressed as RNA copies per million cells, which has been normalized by RNA mass. Now, as you can see, BCL2 inhibition resulted in increased uh, HIV um, elongated transcripts, as well as a trend towards increasing unspliced transcripts. Um, excuse me. And <clears throat> however, this treatment did not um, result in a decrease in HIV DNA that we detected. Next, we looked at BCL2, uh, sorry, BCL6 inhibition. And here uh, we found in our single cell data that upregulation of BCL6 was um, observed in latently infected cells compared to uninfected cells in the wild type virus model. And um, again, we've treated um, cells from six participants with FX1, which is a selective BCL6 inhibitor. And interestingly, what we do see is um, an increase in relative to DMSO, we see an increase in elongated and completed transcripts and this trend towards an increase in multiply spliced transcripts. And this is particularly interesting to us because current LRAs do not express, uh, do not increase the expression of multiply spliced HIV transcripts. Now, one caveat is that normalization um, by RNA mass may exaggerate or obscure differences between treatments due to activation of cells that leads to proliferation. So we also normalized our data by several other methods that include um, using a reference gene, um, and we selected TERT here, and by DNA mass, which also might be a better surrogate for activated cell numbers. But again, we see increased HIV transcription, um, sorry, HIV transcript expression um, in a number of HIV transcript species, including uh, elongated, unspliced, and completed. And we still do see this increase in multiply spliced um, transcripts, even though it wasn't statistically significant. And this, uh, to us, suggests that BCL6 likely plays an important role in maintaining HIV latency. So um, in contrast, we saw that um, CDK13 was downregulated in latently infected cells in the resting cell model. So we hypothesized that perhaps inhibition of CDK13 in infected cells might further reduce HIV transcription. And so again, we treated six uh, cells from six participants with the selective CDK13 inhibitor THC531. And as you can see here, although we didn't detect any differences between elongated and unspliced transcripts, we did see um, this trend towards a decrease in completed transcripts. And importantly, in five out of six of the participants, we could not detect any multiply spliced transcripts um, with, this, with CDK13 inhibition. However, in our DMSO control, um, in those same five out of six participants, we were able to detect multiply spliced transcripts. And this suggests to us that um, CDK13 inhibition might actually decrease HIV transcription, particularly of completed and multiply spliced transcripts. And this actually agrees with recent data that suggests that CDK13 increases HIV-1 mRNA splicing. So to conclude, uh, we think that BCL2, BCL6 and CDK13 may play important roles in HIV latency. We show that uh, BCL6 and BCL2 inhibition may increase HIV transcription. Uh, BCL6 inhibitors in particular may increase completed and multiply spliced HIV RNA. And uh, we think that inhibitors of both of these targets may be candidates for new and more effective latency reversal agents.
we saw that uh, CDK13 inhibition may decrease completed and multiply splice transcripts. And so we think that uh, inhibitors of CDK13 might actually be candidates for new latency promoting agents. And finally, as the small molecule inhibitors um, or drugs that we selected for this study are mostly either in clinical use or in phase one or phase three clinical trials, uh, we think that this approach could generate other potential lead candidates for new latency reversal or latency promoting agents. And with that, I'd like to say a huge thank you to my wonderful mentor, Steve Uckel, who conceptualized these studies and who has been incredibly supportive of everything I do at the VA. Um, thank you also to everyone in the Uckel and Wong labs. Um, many thanks to all of our um, collaborators, including um, Stephen Deeks, Peter Hunt and Becky Ho and the SCOPE team for helping us with um, participant recruitment. And, um, all the members of the um, Green, Verdon, Bosque and um, Butte Lab for uh, their help with the primary cell models and the bioinformatic analyses. Thank you to our funders and of course the study participants without whom this work would not be possible. Thank you. Thank you, Sushama. That was a terrific talk and I'll open it up to questions. Um, just go ahead if you have questions. Yeah, I, uh, great talk, Sushama. I'm I'm really interested in the CDK13 uh, data that you that you showed, and um, and you and you mentioned that many of these targets have inhibitors uh, that are currently in evaluation. Um, is that the case also for the CDK13? And if so, what are the um, so what agents are those? Yeah, so um, there's not a lot. So even the CDK13 inhibitor THC531 is not um, like a CDK13 specific um, inhibitor. It mm. actually inhibits both CDK13 and CDK12. Um, so there aren't that many, um, as far as I'm aware, um, CDK13 inhibitors. But um, a lot of the other um, it, molecules, the small molecule drugs that we've been investigating are um, usually either approved or in um, uh, phase two, phase three clinical trials for other indications, usually associated with cancer and other malignancies. So um, we, we feel as though using this approach might be helpful because we're essentially um, able to um, apply these de-risked and repurposed um, molecules to, to see if they have an effect on um, latency. Great, great. And, and, and is the CDK13, is it, um, does it interact at all with REV? I um, mean, it, it, it seems that there seems to be this, you know, splicing um, association. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm not exactly sure about the entire, like the precise mechanism, but um, there was a recent study that essentially said that um, it can um, interact to uh, increase like uh, the expression of NEF, um, but I'm not 100% sure about like the specific molecular mechanisms by which um, it uh, increases splicing. But I mean, certainly it looks as though like using an inhibitor to um, to inhibit a CDK13 does seem to have an effect on multiply spliced HIV transcripts. But I, I, yeah, as I said, I'm not entirely sure about the molecular mechanism. Great talk, Sushama. Um, quick question, do any, any of the candidates that you identified, um, do any of them um, induce any viral protein synthesis or, or production of, of virions in the supernatant? And, even going beyond induction of viral expression, have you looked to see if any of these can disproportionately induce death of infected cells? That's a great question. And I think that that's something we want to explore for sure. Uh, we, at this stage, we've only looked at the HIV transcription profiling and levels of HIV DNA, but um, certainly we've, we have all the supernatants um, for each of these drug treatments for every donor. So I think that's something that we'd like to do in the future um, because, you know, outside of um, just HIV transcription, it's important to know what kind of other effects it they're having especially a, you know immunological as well um, and whether it's just causing widespread activation or like it's HIV specific so that's definitely something we we plan to do in the future and and do you think um, there's any reason to try them uh, in combination to see if there's synergies between these drugs or 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think, again, this is something that we really want to do because um, our previous studies have shown that um, with the, the currently available latency reversal agents, um, they have very different effects depending on the tissue site. So we see differences in their ability to, to reverse um, blocks to HIV transcription um, in the blood versus the gut. And so we we have reason to, to think that the, the same applies here with these um, small molecule inhibitors. So um, the idea would be to try and apply these to so these inhibitors to tissues and um, get a sense for which of these factors are, are most uh, playing uh, most important or having a, a large role in, in maintaining HIV latency in tissue sites. Um, and then um, think of synergistic combinations that might be um, more effective. Because um, I, I ultimately, I think um, no single agent is going to be efficient to effectively reverse latency or probably even uh, promote latency. So I think ultimately it would have to be a combination, but it, any, any um, combination would have to be able to, like would need to be able to reverse latency in um, tissue sites as well as in the blood. Thanks. Thank you. Um, wonderful, Sushama. I think we're out of time. Um, actually a little over. So um, at this point, uh, other questions can be uh, through email or other contacts with Sushama. Um, I wanted to just thank our three speakers from the VA um, for taking the time to give these presentations, which are all fabulous. And thanks to everybody in the audience. Thank you. And thanks, uh, Steve, uh, for uh, leading the way here. This is terrific. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.